going to call the uh, Sheboygan Common Council Committee of the whole meeting to order. Uh, well, Mary, would you please call the roll? Bellinger. Here. Warren. Here. Carlson. Here. Decker. Here. Donahue. Here. Hammond. Here. Hammond. Excused. Toss. Here. Broussard. Here. Levendusky. Here. Matichek. Uh, not excused. Raisler. Here. Ben Akron. Here. Vanderweel. Not excused. Percy. Uh, not excused. Wangaman. Oh, here. Yeah. Twelve present. We have a quorum. Now let's all stand for the Pledge of Allegiance, please. Allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Next, I will entertain a motion to approve the minutes from December 30th, 2012. So moved. Second. Did I say December? I should have said October. October 30th of 2012. We knew what you meant. We have a motion and a second? Yes. Uh, any discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Chair votes aye. Number five, uh, we have a public forum on, on agenda items. Uh, limit of three minutes. Does anybody from the audience wish to be heard? Does anybody from the audience wish to be heard? Does anybody from the audience wish to be heard? Chairman's comments, I have none at this time. And next on the agenda, we have a, uh, items for discussion and possible recommendation to the Common Council. Uh, agenda item number seven, Council document number 3-1 from November 19th, 2012. Communication number 12-12-13, submitting a communication from Alder Person Donahue uh, presenting a proposal for job responsibilities for the mayor of Sheboygan. Uh, Alder Person Donahue, do you want to come up and lead the discussion, please? Good evening, all. Um, the format of our meeting, uh, with permission of uh, Chairperson Bourne, is a, a little different tonight. We're using microphones because we're um, televising our meeting. Um, and what I am looking for in terms of what we're going to be doing in the next maybe half hour is a discussion of the mayor's job duties and responsibilities. Uh, I believe all of you got the document that I had drafted. Um, it said a draft proposal not subject to open records disclosure. Well, it is subject, and uh, I forgive me for not deleting that from my uh, copy. But it really sets out what I think we're going to try to do today in a really informal, sort of different format than we're used to on the city council. Um, again, with Chairman Boren's permission, um, I'd like to have us just talk a bit about what it is we think the mayor's job duties and responsibilities are. Um, no need to press your button, no need to <coughs> uh, stand up or whatever. We're just, if you can imagine being seated around a big table, we'd like to have that kind of discussion outside of everybody's comfort zone, maybe just a little, but I'm hoping that it'll work. Um, the reason that in this came to my mind was that in the course since I've been elected to the council, it's been pretty clear to me that although the chief administrative officer's job duties and so forth have been discussed, there hasn't been the mirror discussion of what it is we would like the mayor to do. The discussion tonight, um, I think, in order to be at all helpful, needs to be in the abstract. In other words, we could be talking about Mayor Bloomberg. We could be talking about the mayor of Eau Claire 
or the mayor of Los Angeles, but we're talking about the mayor's position. We're not talking about, about anybody who's in the position or who wants the position, but just to flesh out what it is that we think a mayor in the city of Sheboygan with the chief administrative officer's position such as we have it, what are the best and most important things that that mayor can be doing? Does that make sense? Feel okay? If you don't nod and kind of say, hey, sounds good, then I get really insecure. Okay, I've got one <laughs> thumb up. <clears throat> uh, somebody's smiling. Okay, so I, I think that we can uh, uh, open the discussion. And as I say, maybe we could wrap it up because I know it's supper time. Uh, maybe wrap it up around 6 o'clock. What I'd like to finish with is if we do come to some consensus about the items that I've put on this particular job description is that we draft it up in sort of a memorandum of understanding between the council and the mayor and that we forward it to the city council or to the common council at, its, at a meeting for final approval. Okay, make sense? All right, does everybody have a copy? I may actually made a couple of additional ones. That's about the only one I have left. So, okay. No, you can take, we can share. I have another one here. I have mine. Actually, they're complete. Standing anyway. If I get through this tonight without tripping or stuttering or crying, I'm going to be very happy. Bill, did you need? Is that, who else raised a hand? Good. We can get started. Um, you see my introductory remarks? What do you think of those? Um, I indicate that the chief administrator, uh, uh, administrator's position was passed by the council um, in October of 2011. It was recently amended um, in our uh, October 15, 2012 meeting, and I did bring copies of that if, if that comes to anything that we need. Um, but it was my sense that, that there, was not a there was not a discussion of the flip side, which is what we would like the mayor to do. And I said, although the mayor's job has changed since the CAO position was filled, it's not ceremonial. At this time, it's a full-time position whose hours will typically extend beyond a normal 40-hour week. Um, by statute, the mayor is the uh, city's chief executive officer with administrative responsibility, which is shared with elected and administrative officers, boards, commissions, independent uh, appointed officials. However, um, from my perspective, the mayor is the face of city government to those living, visiting, doing business, or relocating to Sheboygan. How is, that, how is that for a premise? Excellent. I like it. Okay. Other thoughts? And Alderman, just Alderman, go ahead. Just make sure you speak in the microphone because we are on TV. Like Good. A, do you want us to stand or up to you? Maybe it'd be better to be seen at home with okay. your stand. Fair enough. Um, thank you. And I, again, I want to preface my comments by, you know, thanking Alderman Donnie, who I understand the premise of what she's coming from. And I guess a, a couple things I would probably change, and I know it's semantics, but you know, in things like this, semantics can sometimes be important. You know, I look at this more than of a, a, much less of a job description as I do more of a guiding principles, um, or a, you know, kind of a, a, again, a guiding principles of how we'd like to see the interaction um, from the mayor. Because things have changed um, significantly over the last um, almost two years now. Um, since um, July of 2011. So I, first off, I, I think this should be more of a guiding principles more than a job description. Um, no more than a job description than any of us have as, as part of this body. You know, I, I think many of the things inside of this are, are very well thought out um, and very pragmatic. You know, I think um, with the great department heads we have, um, with the um, chief administrative officer's position, 
you know, now more than ever, the mayor and the council can be focused on the things that are important, which are providing vision and direction and setting policy for the city going forward and not getting involved in the day-to-day -day mundane operations of, of what uh, department heads and the chief administrative officer should be, should be doing. So those are my first comments. And I think many of this uh, uh, deals with that. Um, secondly, you know, again, um, because of some of the things we've done as a council in the last couple of years, um, we've laid the groundwork. Um, having a full-time mayor, I think, is, you know, a, a mayor's position can be a full-time position um, if that individual focuses on things like economic development, um, you know, meeting with business leaders, meeting with community leaders, meeting not just in the city but regionally and trying to build um, a, a good corridor of economic development. Um, and then secondly, I think, or excuse me, finally, um, you know, again, the, the, as, as Alderman Donahue indicated, you know, the mayor's position is the face of the city. You know, so we want those people to conduct themselves professionally both inside of City Hall and outside of City Hall, whether it's parades, ribbon cuttings, whatever the case may be, we want them to conduct themselves with professionalism as the representative of not only, you know, the, the, the uh, employees of City Hall, but of the 49,000 plus citizens we have in this community. So um, again, I look at this as more of a guiding principles and some, um, you know, 10 points to kind of live by um, versus a job description. But I, again, I think those are just a couple of my thoughts um, as we look forward um, or as we look um, at this document. So thank you again for, sure. for Great. your work efforts. Feedback on that? Ideas? I have something. Uh, uh, and this, Mary Lynn, you may be able to answer this, or Steve, uh, in the part, the first paragraph after the job responsibilities you have by statute, would some of those statutes uh, be state statutes and local things that we've developed over the years as far as uh, the mayor as the chief executive officer? Is that partly state statute and also local ordinances or resolutions that we've had over the years? Well, I think it's a combination of both. Uh, and it's a good question. Um, the, um, the statutory, and Steve is going to chime in and correct me if I, if I get this wrong. Um, the statutes are relatively limited in telling us what the mayor does. Um, there are certain um, statutory requirements. And Steve actually pointed out to me. Actually, can I just, can I, if I stand here, can you, there, Mary Lynn. Yeah, the camera can't see you. Should I fall on my sword now or later? Or fall on the microphone. We've all been involved in discussions, right, where people sit around and they really get into things and they have good discussions. That's what I'm looking for tonight, so. Um, uh, Steve, in fact, pointed out to me that um, the mayor has other additional statutory responsibilities which um, include the ability to hire um, or to provide for unpaid security forces in the uh, in name of an emergency. So there are statutory requirements. I bet you did not know that, Mayor. You did know that. So if we all get drafted into the city guard, we'll, we'll know where that's coming from. Um, and then there are, of course, um, Daryl can help us out with that. Um, there are ordinances that provide the mayor's uh, responsibility in certain respects as well. If, in fact, we come, and I do agree with Don, I think the idea of guiding principles or operating principles is, is a better way for us to approach this because it has to come, the mayor and the council need to agree on these things in order for it to be a working document. Um, there may be certain ordinance changes that might be required. Um, if you look at the budgeting um, requirements in uh, Chapter 2, 2-901 um, to 907, I believe, um, uh, there are some uh, requirements for the mayor's participation in the budget process. Um, those are things that, again, we need to look at, particularly in terms of the chief administrative officer's position. 
sometimes it's hard to go through and make sure that all of your ordinances are completely consistent and the CAO's position has only been in place for a fairly short period of time. So I think those are things that we would probably need to, to clear up to some extent. Steve, chime in. Um, yes, thank you, Marilyn. Uh, I think I did talk about those provisions in the ordinances, but I looked and the council has made amendments to those ordinances that reflect that the, basically the mayor's been removed from the executive budget preparation, and it's indicated in the ordinances now that the chief administrative officer uh, is functioned to do that. Uh, so those ordinance changes have been put in place already. And that, I know, uh, at least anecdotally in the last year, was some cause for some confusion between uh, the role of the mayor and the chief administrative officer. Um, so if we look at the guiding principles in terms of statutory duties, we may want to expand that a little bit and work in the actual st uh, the additional ones that, that Steve had mentioned to me. Um, but the statutory duties are the statutory duties. Some of them can be delegated. Clearly one of the issues we deal with is dealing with the budget and preparation of the budget. So I think those are things that we're going to need to hash through uh, probably in more detail because I think that's where some of our um, Hmm. Concerns have arisen in the uh, in the past few months. I've got a couple more if I could sure. continue. Uh, <clears throat> under essential duties number one, uh, the last sentence it says the mayor ensures the city ordinances and state laws are observed and enforced, and that all city officers and employees discharge their duties. Uh, that to me could possibly cause a conflict with the chief administrative officer because if the mayor is enforcing or directing employees, to me that could cause a problem in not knowing ultimately where the buck stops. And I guess under this form of government that we're under right now, at the end of the day, the chief administrative officer is where the buck stops and department heads have to have a clear line of authority as to who at the end of the day is their boss. So I'm just somewhat concerned about that language and that one right there. <clears throat> Any comments, feedback on that, Don? Um, thank you. I think um, you know, some of that was addressed when we put the chief administrative officer's position in. Um, the reporting responsibilities um, were pretty clearly delineated as part of that exercise. Um, so you know, I, I, to your point, I might be counter um, you know, counter to what we've put in other documents, um, you know, where the department heads um, report to the chief administrative officer, um, and that's, I think, pretty clearly delineated. Um, sorry, sure. uh, I didn't bring my statute book, and perhaps I can go get it uh, in a minute, but I believe that is language taken from the it is. statutes as far as the mayor's authority, so it, uh, and I think it's important uh, you're not looking at doing a charter ordinance where you're uh, changing the statutory authority of the mayor, I don't believe. I think you just want to provide some sort of uh, right. uh, aid so that uh, we have an efficient, uh, efficiently operating government. Uh, but those are statutory responsibilities of the mayor. So In the way, move. from my perspective, but I'd be interested in what you all think, that is done um, simply because we have created a, a chief administrative officer position and given that position the responsibility for um, supervising department heads, uh, developing budgets with department heads and so forth does not mean that the mayor is an absent figure and does nothing with respect to that. Um, the idea is that there is some delegation of power through the creation of the CAO job position, the chief administrative officer job position, and the mayor can't just say, all I'm going to do is recruit businesses for the South Pier. I don't care what happens to the budget. I don't care what happens to other parts of city government. So the mayor's position by statute really does require the sort of overall 
uh, position, um, just as the President of the United States has the overall authority to make sure that the laws of the country are followed and so forth, that authority is delegated. That's my, at least that would be an analogy. Well, uh, I, I would say that I don't think the council has the authority to delegate the mayoral authority. I think that's up to the mayor. If he wants to delegate his authority to someone, that's up to him. If it's a statutory duty that he's, the mayor's got, the council can't uh, dictate that someone else has that authority instead of the mayor. Uh, but certainly, we've created a chief administrative officer position. I think the intent of this is to, uh, and, and the chief administrative officer is not provided for by statute. So that's, that's the conundrum, is fitting the chief administrative officer position into a statutory framework where it just references mayors. And I think this is a good, good uh, helpful tool to, uh, to have the discussion on how that position fits within the framework. Bingo. So I think we're all on the same page. Other thoughts? Observations? You, they're going to make you come up here and use a microphone, or Scott's going to come out and yell at you, or you can use mine. I, I guess just for clarity for the people in the public, when you say st statutory versus ordinance, you're saying state, state statutes say that. So we as a body, as a common council, which I served on many years, don't have the authority to change state statutes. Don't we wish, though? Sometimes. <laughs> Sometimes you don't want them. Exactly. All right. But it is state statutes. Alderman right. Hammond. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. Just to clarify that, though, state statutes outline a lot of various different duties and responsibilities, not only for the mayors, but for other positions. But there is a concept of home rule that allows us as a body to um, you know, do certain things outside the, or you know, maybe you can explain that home rule a little bit um, because it's, it's not as cut and dry as that the state says this and we can't change it. Um, that's where charter ordinances come into play. Uh, the, uh, uh, the, the council has statutory home rule authority and uh, by charter ordinance can change uh, provisions in the statutes uh, that relate to local, our local operation. But that requires two-thirds vote, requires a chance for a referendum by the electorate. Um, and it was not my understanding that the intent here was to change the statutory authority of the mayor, but rather to try to, within the context of the statutes, and our ordinances to uh, get some sort of sense of as to what the mayor is doing versus what the chief administrative officer is doing uh, in the administration of the government. Agreed. I just wanted to make sure it was clear that how that works. Thank you. All right. And um, we're kind of getting at the heart of, um, again, the relationship between the chief administrative officer's duties and the mayor's statutory and uh, uh, duties uh, conferred upon him at this point um, by the city. Before we get bogged down in legalese, um, I don't mind that typically, but, um, but for tonight, if we could just uh, go on to number two. One of the mayor's most important jobs, and I want your feedback on this, is supporting and facilitating economic growth within the city. The mayor actively works with economic development organizations in the city and county, such as the Chamber of Commerce and the Sheboygan Economic uh, Development Corporation, Sheboygan County Economic Development Corporation, as well as other local, state, and na national organizations to attract new businesses and good jobs to the city. The mayor is an active and enthusiastic representative for the city's best interests. What do you think? Sound good? Additions, corrections, Don. Alderman Hammond. Thank you. I'll throw my two cents in again. I, I mean, I think that's one of the most critical positions, or one of the most critical functions of a, of a full-time mayor, um, is to be the champion of economic development, um, or at very least, you know, part of the economic development process. Um, you know, in understanding and having good relationships with the business community, um, with the stakeholders, um, EDCs, whatever the case may be. I mean, I think, 
you know, that's a, a, a very powerful, um, you know, job responsibility. Okay. Other thoughts? It's kind of a no-brainer, but I, I think for us to say it out loud, and um, I think all of our mayors have acted in this respect, but to say it out loud and to bring it into sharp relief I think is important. I put it as number two right after statutory duties because like Don, I think that um, when people can sit down and say, I met with the mayor, it means something. And it is a position of that kind of power um, that um, makes people excited to, to be a part of a structure that can encourage economic development, if that makes sense. Okay, without a lot of feedback, I'm gonna move right along. The mayor is the city's goodwill ambassador in face of city government. Um, and the, the mayor spends significant time meeting with citizens, uh, addressing constituent questions, um, attends and participates in community activities, um, which enhance the visibility and economic well-being of the city. Again, kind of a no-brainer, but what do you think? I would, I would have a comment on that if nobody else does, and that would be uh, uh, the mayor is the goodwill ambassador in the face of city government. Uh, face of city government, uh, I think a couple times since Mr. Amodio has been chief administrative officers, he's had to speak in on the benef uh, on behalf of the city with some, I don't know if you want to call them unfortunate situations that we've had. I remember the incident with the DPW driver. I think Mr. Amodio was the, you might say, the, the PR person or the lead spokesman for the city. So I think there has to be a delineation in that regard of who's the, uh, who's the voice of the city and those types of things. Alderman Hammond? And again, this is, uh, you know, I know this isn't a statutory power of, of the mayor's position. Um, when we created the CAO's position, public information officer was one of the duties that was put under that. Now again, you know, face of the city could be construed in many, many different ways. You know, is that parades and ribbon cuttings and, mm -hmm. you know, or is it in the event of tragedies and you know, those types of things that, uh, um, you know, and ideally in those types of situations, as tragic as they are, you know, all hands would be on deck for that one. It wouldn't just be, you know, one person standing behind a podium. So. But it is true. Yes, Corey. I, I guess I disagree a little bit. I think in the, in the face of the tragedy, I think the, the <clears throat> constituents want to see the mayor and what he has to say. I, and they, I, think, I think they've elected him to, to be the mayor and, and they want to know how he's going to lead us, uh, you know, I look at the same as through our employment at the Sheriff's Department, you know, we have people that, that talk of different news releases and such, but when the tragedy strikes, I think they want to know what the Sheriff is going to do to do it, and I, I think that's the same as far as the Mayor's role. And we could look at the, um, and that, that is an excellent point, we could look at the CAO job description because as Don indicated, the I think it's the last um, specific uh, job duty is for the um, CAO to act as the public information officer for the city, which would typically tend to be your spokesperson. So we may want to take a look at that. Um, as we uh, as we go along. Um, the mayor is the voice of city government with respect to legislative matters at regional and state levels, um, including but not limiting to testifying as needing um, uh, as needed at state uh, level and working in a cooperative manner with other local units of government. Comments? I, I would have, Jim? I, would, sure. I, I don't want to do all the conversation here, but. Somebody's uh, got to. You uh, people are disappointed. <laughs> no, uh, the, vo kidding. the voice of city government re with respect to legislative matters at the regional, state, local level, I would presume if, if the mayor was going to uh, have that responsibility, that the position on a piece of state legislation or whatever, what what he would be testifying, what he would be testifying would be the will of the council after consulting with the council. For example, if there's a particular bill in the legislative session, uh, it has to be. A, I would think that the mayor's testimony at those state meetings would have to be the consensus of the council of which way we want to go on a particular piece of legislation. Maybe that's taken for granted in what you're seeing here. But I think you understand what I'm saying. 
I do. Um, what do you all think? Is, has there been, um, I'm trying to remember back in the last administrations, has there been much legislative advocacy from the local to the state level? <coughs> do you think it's a good idea? Dave? I guess just to weigh in a little bit, um, I, I, to, I somewhat agree with, with Alderman Bourne and somewhat disagree in that. I, I think you're right, there's going to be certain instances where the mayor would be the, the representative of the Sheboygan Common Council representing a certain function or a certain um, viewpoint or advocating for a certain agenda. However, I also think there's going to be times, and, and, and I can't think of one myself either, but there, there could be times where he is advocating for a, a, a personally elected agenda. Again, we all hate the term, but at the end of the day, we are all elected politicians and we all run under a, an agenda or a set of ideas that we all put out for the public to let them know these are the, the stances and the stands we have on certain issues. So I think that really could go either way. I mean, it, it, it could be the mayor representing the city of Sheboygan and the Sheboygan Common Council's decision at a state level or, or further, or it could be him advocating for a specific, you know, <coughs> politically motivated agenda, however you would like to term that. Uh, again, I think it's important that we consider this on the, the abstract and the macro level, but I, I do think that, again, it could go either way, so I, I really don't think we should try to limit that because, I, again, I think we all are elected to represent our, the people that voted us the people that elected us to these positions. And I like to think that they have elected us based on the agenda, based on our stances towards the certain topics and issues that we've expressed. So uh, I think that his advocacy or his or her advocacy uh, of any issues could certainly be in representation of us, but it could be in representation of his, his own agenda as well. Their comments, Don? You know, I, I would take a little bit of issue as the mayor is a representative of the 49,000 people. I would hope that that individual would not be going to Madison or Washington advocating their own views over the views of or the wishes of um, the body for which that individual represents. Um, I understand we all have our, our own agendas to some extent, um, but again, in the capacity of this, representing city, the voice of city government with respect, it should be what the will of the, of the constituency or in this, as Alderman Bourne, the, the collective thoughts of, the, of this body would be, now if they want to go to Madison, if Don wants to go to Madison and, and you know, advocate for something, that, that's fine, but I wouldn't do it as a representative of, as president of the Sheboygan Common Council, I'd be doing it as Don Hammond. So I think there, that, mm -hmm. that semantics is important there. Well, I think this brings up a good issue. First of all, um, because um, some fairly nasty things have been done to local governments at the state level, um, and uh, whether you agree or disagree with that, um, it is interesting that we have done relatively little legislative advocacy. Assuming that that might happen, um, would you all be comfortable with an amendment to this um, that basically um, says that when the mayor is speaking as the voice of city government. It is done with the consensus or with the advice and counsel of the, or consent of the city council or of the common council. Because what David is saying is we all have our first amendment rights to go down and talk about what we, you know, what we believe in and, and so forth. But if the mayor or frankly, if any of us would be going down to testify for the common council um, if we were speaking as that voice, we'd want to make sure that at least a majority of the Common Council agrees with us. Is that, what do you think? David. Thanks. Again, I can't actually think of a time that this has come to play or, or that right. I can consider. Um, I'm just saying, again, I think, I think it, it states that the mayor is the voice of city government in respect to the legislative matters and so on and so forth. And, and I think it does give the ability of the mayor's office to advocate for the mayor's office. That's what he's elected to do. Um, you know, when, when we talk about, um, you know, advocating for the, the city of Sheboygan for the 49,000 people that live here, he was elected by those same people. So I do think he or she in that office should have the ability to advocate 
for that office. That's what he was elected, he or she was elected to do, and I think that's important. Like I said, I can't think of a time um, or, or an instance that would call for that. I think most of the instances that would call for the mayor or city officials to go and advocate, whether it be funding for street repair or different road projects or whatever the case may be, I think everybody in this room would probably be advocating all in the same direction. Um, but I do think it is the ability of the elected office of the mayor to advocate for the elected office of the mayor. Thoughts, feedback? Attorney McLean. Uh, thank you, uh, Alderman Warren. I guess I see one way to, to address this, you know, I, I see it, it, if this is strictly a job description with essential duties and responsibilities by saying that the mayor is this, it's, it's sort of saying that nobody else is that, you know, you're, I, um, I kind of like the idea of rather than call these job duties and responsibilities and uh, so forth, it's more Alderman Hammond's comment that these are kind of guiding principles that while, you know, aspirationally, you know, the mayor is the goodwill ambassador, but we're not saying that, okay, he's the goodwill ambassador, but no one else is a goodwill ambassador for the city or no one else uh, is the face of the city council or the, or the city government. Uh, that I'm concerned by the uh, kind of the definiteness of a job description sort of statement that by saying that this is the mayor's job that Therefore, it's not anybody else's, it's, it is the mayor's, as opposed to uh, more illustrative type of uh, responsibilities or aspirations or guiding principles. I think uh, uh, it's less prone to mischief from the standpoint of the mayor saying, no, it says in here that I'm the goodwill ambassador or I'm the face of the city and not you. Um, and uh, likewise, it, it avoids the mischief of you know, a member of the public who's disgruntled with the mayor saying, well, it says in your job description that you had to do this and you let somebody else do it or <coughs> something like that. Uh, keep it to guiding principles. That's just my comment and observation. And Steve, I think we'll circle back to that at the very end um, because I think Don's points were, that is an excellent point and I want to hear what folks think about calling these guiding principles as opposed to you know, uh, uh, job responsibilities or, or whatever. But just going back to number four, Don? Um, two quick comments. First off, um, and I think, Dave, this might just be semantics, um, so correct me if I'm wrong, but I think the position of the mayor, just like, you know, my position is to advocate for these 6,000-ish constituents in my district the mayor's position is not to advocate for the mayor's office, it's to advocate for the 49,000 plus people we have in the light of streets or whatever the issue is. So I think it was just semantics, but you know, I don't think any of us think that the mayor's position should be advocating strongly for the mayor's office, it should be advocating for the 49,000 plus constituents. But to, to Steve's point a little bit, I think we also have to be careful with this to an, to an extent that every mayor, every older person brings a different skill set to the table. And whether, and again, we can look back in history at the mayors and councils and, and some have had stronger financial backgrounds than others. Some have had better um, you know, boardroom acumen than others. Some of them better, um, you know, um, what's the, you know, greeters, if you will, um, you know, good uh, faces of the, of the city, um, and some haven't. Um, so I think we also want to be careful that we don't pigeonhole this and set up a mayor um, or a council for failure by saying, you know, you're, you're the face of the city, you're the public face when that's really not their strength. And maybe that's the strength of someone else. Maybe that's the strength of the council president or the strength of pick somebody um, where the mayor's strength might be more on behind the scenes kind of things. Um, so to Steve's point, I think we want to be careful that we don't uh, that we, we recognize that mayors have different personalities and that um, the smart ones will look around that the team they have assembled, recognize their weaknesses, and bring those people on that can help them, you know, fill those weaknesses with strengths. So. Good. Um, let me rework the language a little bit on four that would... Um, 
um, indicate that when the mayor is speaking as the voice of the city, um, there needs to be some um, advice and consent from the council. And you all take a look at it, and if we're not comfortable with it, we can keep working on that. In the interest of moving along, uh, the mayor does deliver an annual state of the city address to the council. Um, the mayor's vision for the city is a key element of the address and sets out the hopes and expectations for the mayor, the common council, and all elements of city government to make sure that Sheboygan is a great place to live and raise a family. Now again, this is aspirational. There, are, and just speaking to Don's points, there may be some mayors who have stronger writing skills or speaking skills or whatever, but my question to you, if, if we were looking at guiding principles, would this state of the city address reflect those kinds of issues, values, statements, and so forth? Sound good? Sound not so good? Okay. I think that it's, or, Wait, uh, I'm, I'm gonna call on Scott. Well, at the end where it says a great place to live in, raise a family, I would maybe add also to run a business. Um, how about a great place to live and work? It's not everybody runs a business, but we all work. Does that sound good? All right. Um, number six is, uh, there's a little more meat on the bones here. Please. please. Um, the mayor provides input and cooperates with the CAO, department heads, and older persons in developing the city's annual budget. What do you all think? Remember that the, um, the hold on just a sec. What's getting passed around right now is the um, essential duties and responsibilities of the chief administrative officer. This is as amended on October 15th, 2012. Um, and you'll notice that number one says develop and implement an annual budget under the direction of the common council with input from the mayor. Um, my number six reflects that, more or less. Um, and I think we all need to be comfortable with the fact that the CAO, according to the job description, does develop and implement the annual budget. Let's just talk about develop, because implement is, is more administrative. Develops the annual budget under the direction of the council with input from the mayor. and. We're saying in our guiding principles <coughs> that the mayor provides input and cooperates with the CAO, department heads, and older persons in developing the city's annual budget. To me, these, these guiding principles and this job description kind of move together. They fit together well, but I would appreciate your input. Hammond, would you have anything on this thing that you work, you work pretty closely with the C, Ch chief administrative officer and, and the mayor? What's been the history? Yeah, I, I would, I think the, I don't have a, pro other than the department heads, I'd probably, you know, strike that portion of it. Um, you know, if we're keeping this kind of at the 30,000 foot level, you know, it's kind of a, a guiding principle, um, you know, because the, the council, um, will dictate, or, or not dictate, would you phrase that? We'll put together goals and objectives for, and then it's the CEO's responsibility to get that down to the department heads and roll all that up. So maybe more of an administrative change than, than anything, but again, I'm going back to my original that, you know, this body along with the <coughs> mayor, mayor's office should be eventually getting to the point where it's, you know, setting vision, direction, and policy, not, you know, going to DPW and saying whatever or to fire and saying whatever and you know, that's what 
the chief administrative officer's job is to do is to take those budgets and roll them up under the uh, guidelines we've provided. Other thoughts? Okay. Did you have something, Alderman Van Akron? I do, and I, I completely agree with Alderman Hammond that I think it's important that we set those goals and objectives and, and that uh, the chief administrator then rolls out you know, and implements those. I think that's the, the you know, something that we've, we've struggled with a little bit over the last couple of years. I, it's, it's, it's a new function that we're doing, and I think that's what's important is that we, we lay out that vision, we lay out those goals, we lay out those objectives. Obviously, again, the, the mayor and the mayor's office is an elected official. He's going to have his own opinion. He or she will have his own opinion and, and on those, but at the same time, we all do, and then at the end of that, um, when once we've set those goals and objectives, I think it's you know the role of the CAO to then you know you know delineate those down to the the department heads and, and come up with the best solution that we can from that point on. So no, I fully agree with this. Thank you. All right, um, excellent. Um, the um, CAO, I'm looking at seven, is responsible for the supervision and work performance of the department heads. The mayor may provide, or we may want to rephrase that, should or will provide observations and feedback about such work performance at the request of the CAO. I'll, I'll comment if it's okay. I mean, it's kind of a, I would, uh, that'd be an expectation. <clears throat> You know, from anybody in the roles that we're in, if there's a performance issue, or good or bad, you know, if we've got an outstanding performer, that should be pointed out to um, the chief administrative officer and, or the department head. You know, our employees deserve the feedback, um, both positive and negative. I mean, so I think that uh, um, should go without saying. So many what, words. Do, what, do you, what do you all think is the role of the mayor in terms of being involved with um, likely not um, uh, employees under, under department heads, but interaction with department heads themselves? This is, this is a little fuzzy, and so my question is, well, where do you think that we ought to go with that? Alderman Corey? Riesler. I guess I look, I think that he has a responsibility to um, work with the department heads for the simple fact that, I mean, some of them, well, I'm just pulling Chad off the top of my head as far as the economic development and different areas like that that he's going to work closely with, um, or whether it's community problems with the police department, you know, that they're working on and addressing uh, the gateway neighborhood, you know, working with them. Uh, so I, I guess I, I think that there is a expectation that he does have a good working relationship with them and a close relationship with them. Yeah. Nodding heads yet, Daryl? And the, uh, I think in that position, he wouldn't be able to give input on the budget or give, I mean, even down to giving a state of the city address if he didn't have a good working relationship with the department head. So, I mean, he's got to, he or she has to be knowledgeable about the city. Otherwise, anything that comes out of their mouth may not be of value. Um, can I delete at the request of the chief administrative officer based on what you all are saying? that it's an inherent duty, an inherent responsibility? Uh, just coming, I think so, and then, I mean, it's up to the chief administrative officer of what action they're gonna take, whether it's good or bad or, or none, or come to council and say, you know, here's the, the information I received from the mayor or that the, you know, this department is not meeting the expectations and we now need to look at some further action. I mean, it, it kind of works, it's a two-way street. I'm thinking everybody hopefully can cooperatively work together with it. And hopefully we don't have a situation like that. Okay. Perfect. Um, and that really segues now into number uh, attorney, eight. Excuse me, Attorney oh, McLean had yes. something. Oh, this a comment I had provided to uh, Alderman Downey previously, but I guess I have a little issue with at the request of the Chief Administrative Officer in this provision. That, and I think no. it's been sort of addressed. I think that uh, the mayor should be able to provide observations and feedback about work performance uh, at his discretion, his or her discretion. Uh, I don't think you have to wait until chief administrative officer comes up to him and uh, says, you got any issues with. And what I'm hearing tonight from folks is that not 
that it really is an important affirmative duty of the mayor to, to understand what department heads are doing, what departments are doing, you know, what, what's going on and so forth. So one other issue as it, as it relates to departments, it, statutory authority of the mayor, he's the head of the fire and police department. So uh, you can't just by uh, some uh, job description here, rule that out. That's uh, statutory authority of the mayor. So there's another provision for the police chief to obey written, uh, written orders of the, of the mayor. And it doesn't uh, provide for obeying uh, written orders of the chief administrative officer. So those are things that uh, while you, the chief administrative officer position has job description and he basically uh, manages the departments, you got to bear in mind that statutorily uh, the mayor still got some authority over at least the police and fire departments. Perfect. Jim? It was, uh, Attorney McLean, it was my understanding that we had a discussion about that last year, and it was my understanding that we changed, we changed the change that the police chief and the fire chief were going to report to the chief administrative officers. Now, maybe that was in uh, everyday administrative things versus, versus the power of the mayor, versus the power that the mayor has in cases of city emergencies like, uh, asking the governor to call out the National Guard or whatever, whatever those police powers. Uh, so that's right. I, I believe you're correct all the yeah, more. I, I think the okay. job description for chief administrative officers does say sort of uh, the day to day reporting uh, administratively, uh, police chief and uh, fire <coughs> chief report to the uh, chief and of administrative course, officer. And then there's also the layer of the police and fire commission. But, but uh, you got to bear in mind that that's uh, in the context of the statutory authority of the mayor as well. Good. All right. So we'll do that. Um, number eight, the mayor, can I'm just kind of going through this because we do want to keep moving along. The mayor and the chief administrative officer understand and support the need for each to work cooperatively with the other to ensure that the best interests of the city are always of primary importance. Should go without saying. Should go without saying, okay. But actually, it is very good to say it, and we're all comfortable with that. I think that that is a, is a uh, kind of a basic uh, operating principle there. Um, number nine is, uh, is statutory. The, the mayor makes all required and necessary appointments to special and standing committees. Um, I don't, does anyone have any comment on, on nine? I mean, that's. I, w I would just ask, are those, uh, are those uh, city statutes or state statutes that provide those powers or both. That's state law, and our city ordinances follow state law. All right. And number 10 is of particular interest to me just because I do a lot of strategic planning for folks. Oh, um, Marilyn, I'm sorry yeah. to interrupt, but uh, yes. just one qualification there. Uh, most, uh, most of our appointments, the mayor has authority to make the appointments, but they're subject to approval of the common council. So, uh, and that doesn't really set anyone's hair on fire. I don't think so. We're good there. Um, number 10, the mayor provides input and cooperates with the chief administrative officer, department heads, and alder persons to develop and implement short and long-term strategic plans for the city. That's, that again uh, fits in with the chief administrative officer's uh, job duties. Um, which is number two, develop the, the CAO is charged with developing short and long-term strategic plans for the city under the direction of the Common Council with input from the mayor. So that this, this particular guiding principle just makes it completely clear that these are shared responsibilities. <coughs> okay. So what have we missed? Are there, any, are there any other guiding principles that we would like to see the mayor's position to have? given the way we are structured? Don? I mean, I guess going back to some of the opening comments, um, you know, if you call it a job description, it's one thing. You call it guiding principles, I think we want to um, 
you know, have a component, you know, and again, no different if we were writing one for the Common Council President, the Committee of the Whole Chair, Attorney McLean's office, you know, we would expect that office to conduct themselves, again, as a guiding principle, with professionalism and a, a level of decorum expected of that office. Um, and I think, you know, something to that effect should be part of this um, as far as, you know, again, under the auspice of a guiding principle. Okay. Um, How you word that? Good luck. <laughs> Up to the wordsmith. Yep. Um, I um, are we all agreed that we should retitle this as guiding principles? I'm very comfortable with that, and I think that really reflects much more what we're what we're getting at here. Um, and I do note uh, Don's comments, and I'll I'll work that in. Um, and then there were some changes that we did make, which I will uh, will make um, procedurally. In, I, th I think this should be a, a resolution. I had, I had termed it a, a memorandum of understanding. It might be a resolution regarding guiding principles. I would be open to input or suggestions for those from those who would have a better sense of um, just how to implement this in the best way. If I could ask Steve a question. Uh, Steve, we have a document on the floor, which is the, uh, the document that I cited before, 3.1 from November 19th. Would it be appropriate for Alderperson Donahue to, uh, I don't know if the word clean up, clean up the document with our discussion tonight and then bring it back to the council in two weeks or whatever the next meeting is? What, what, would, what would be the appropriate follow up on the discussion tonight, what's the appropriate thing to do? <clears throat> uh, well, I think you could do it a couple of different ways. One would be perhaps to uh, uh, request all the person Donahue to uh, clean it up and flush it out based on the conversation and either bring it back to this body as a committee of the whole for further discussion uh, or send something directly to the council, I guess that would that would be a possibility. I'm anticipating having another committee of the whole meeting in early uh, February, first or second week of February. Uh, I want to give the uh, public works director a uh, opportunity to present his goals and objectives for his department that he went over with the public works department the other night. It's very well done, and I think it's important for the council to see that. So if we would do something in the first or second week of February, as far as the committee of the whole, would you be ready at that time? Sure. No problem. So maybe what we could do, uh, if it's all right with you, all our person Donahue, is hold document 3.1 for your revisions and then bring it back to this body the first or second week of February and then we can get that sent to the council if that's the wish of the body for maybe the second week in February and, and take a vote on it. Is that satisfactory with the, with the members of the committee? <clears throat> Alderman Hammond? I'll make that motion to hold. Second. We have a motion and a second to hold document 3.1. Uh, I think we can do a, all eyes on this one. All in favor? Aye. aye. Opposed? Chair votes aye. Thank you very much, Alder Person Donahue, for your work on this so far. Yeah, well, thank you all for <coughs> participating in the discussion and uh, uh, much appreciated. Mary? <coughs> Mary, can you just put me down as abstaining? Okay. <coughs> Okay, we're going to move on to uh, item number eight on the agenda, which is uh, resolution number 121-12-13 by Alderperson, Alderperson Hammond, a resolution authorizing the appropriate city officials to execute the combined dispatch intergovernmental cooperative agreement. Uh, I'll call on you first, Alderman Hammond, maybe just to, if, if there's some thank yous, <coughs> Thank you is an order from the team that worked on this from the city and the county side. And then I'll ask uh, Attorney McLean to actually go over the document and maybe have Chief Administrative Officer uh, Amodio go over the financial implications of this for the city. And I would also like to touch on a few, with your permission, uh, a few of the components of the document that I think might be important to note outside of um, this, but yeah, I mean, this has been a, uh, obviously many of you guys know, 40 years in the coming. Um, hopefully we don't have another shared service that takes another 40 years to get to. 
Um, but we've had, uh, you know, as you know, we started working on this in October of 2011. Um, and uh, in addition to this, there were a lot of other things going on. And as is well documented, it started off with a lunch between Adam and I. And I'm not sure we either one of us knew what we were getting into when we decided to do that. But, um, you know, throughout that period of time, um, you know, certainly um, from our side, Jim Amodio, the Joint Chiefs, um, Herman and, and Domagoski, um, um, Adam Payne from the county, Inspector Bruckbauer, the county sheriff, um, and most recently Jeff Rousseau, the, uh, did I pronounce that right? It's the new inspector? Jim, Jim Rousseau, um, the new inspector, um, our incoming inspector, all of those guys had a, a lot of hand in this. We've had a lot of meetings, um, and uh, most recently Attorney McLean and, and Attorney Busing from the county, again, um, during our Christmas holiday, um, got together to hammer out the final details of this. So um, I, I, I can't, even can't even count how many meetings we've had in the back and forth, and it's close to happening, it's not gonna happen, so on and so forth. So I really, really like to thank those people and anybody else involved um, in setting up meetings or whatever the case may be, because um, it, it, was, it was quite a labor. Um, and, but we're here, um, and we've got a intergovernmental agreement together, and I was shocked it was only five pages. Um, so thanks, Steve. We're keeping it under a, under a novel. Um, just a couple points I'd like to, to point out. Um, as part of this, there's gonna be the creation of an advisory committee. And that advisory committee is gonna be a working um, committee um, comprised of some individuals from the Sheriff's Department, our police department, um, and then also um, other law enforcement and um, uh, presumably some uh, representatives of the fire community as well in developing protocols developing standard operating procedures um, and starting the process of doing the things necessary to combine a dispatch center. Right now, we're targeting December of 2015, which seems like an eternity, um, but realistically, by the time we get architectural drawings, um, you know, contractors, contracts, and in the building, um, and of course, all the training that needs to go on, we'll be right up there and um, pushing up against that in a heartbeat. So um, I'm very excited um, that we got to this point. Um, and I, I think many of those people, Gary Maples is probably one of them, um, who've been working on this for decades, um, are, are very happy too. So um, I'll turn it over to Steve to, to go through the rest, but I just wanted to point out those two are our key components to this, the advisory committee and also the December 31st deadline. Steve. Thanks, Mr. Chairman. Uh, and thank you, Alderman Hammond. I, I think one thing that's important to point out is in the purpose section of the agreement, uh, the middle of the uh, section sets out what, what's happening or what the proposal is to happen. It says this agreement is intended to effectuate the transfer of dispatch services currently operated by the city to the county, such that the county will then maintain and operate dispatch services for the city as well as for all other local units of government within Sheboygan County. I know discussion over the years there's been various permutations of uh, how, how are you gonna combine things? Well, that's the purpose here. It, the com combining is basically for uh, the county to take over all the dispatch <coughs> services uh, from the city so that they, uh, they will be providing services uniformly throughout entire Sheboygan County. Uh, right now, the county provides dispatch services for everybody in the county except the city. So that's the main purpose of the uh, agreement, and that's, that's really uh, how the agreement is structured, is how do you get to that end. Uh, the, uh, the term of the agreement in Section 3 is it remains in force and effect until such time as the county has uh, dispatch, the city dispatch responsibilities have been fully integrated by the county into the countywide dispatch center and the city has made its fin financial contribution to the county pursuant to paragraph seven. So uh, while later on the, uh, the goal is, and it's written as a goal and not a contractual deadline, the goal is for the county to take over the dispatch operation by the end of 2015 may happen sooner may happen a little later but that's that's the object and until such time as that happens the agreement remains in effect uh, 
the uh, under the authority entered into under the intergovernmental cooperation statutes. The state of Wisconsin, as well as all other states, have uh, statutes that really encourage and promote intergovernmental cooperation. Uh, normally, as a city governmental body, we're usually duking it out with other forms of government, especially the towns. But the, uh, the statutes really try to encourage and promote intergovernmental cooperation and provide for uh, broad powers of governmental bodies to contract with one another. And uh, basically, as long as it's not uh, illegal to do, uh, the state encourages governmental bodies to cooperate. Uh, under sub five services to be provided by the county, as I say, the uh, concept is the county takes over the dispatch operations. The issue arose as to what happens with the city dispatchers currently, and that's certainly a, a, a big concern of the existing dispatchers. Uh, are they gonna be losing their jobs? Well, the bottom of the page, the county agrees that during the term of the agreement, it will be will give primary consideration in the hiring of its new employees for dispatch operations from the pool of currently employed and qualified city dispatch personnel, so long as such personnel are willing to accept such positions. So there's, it, it's not binding on the county that the county has to hire all our existing city dispatchers, but uh, they have agreed to give primary consideration to those folks when they're hiring the new dispatchers. <clears throat> uh, section six services to be provided by the city, basically talks about city cooperating with the county, transitioning the process, and also agreeing to provide a dispatch, a, a backup dispatch location. Uh, right now it's contemplated in the agreement that it be the, at the current police station, but it could be at such other location as the parties may agree to house a backup dispatch system that will be geographically separate from the dispatch center at the uh, county's law enforcement center. Attorney McQueen, I think I'll have Mr. Amodio take uh, maybe number seven and uh, seven A and B as far as the financial and the implications and how we're gonna come up with the money. So uh, Mr. Amodio, if you'd like to step up to the podium and cover those, and then I'll have you take over on the rest of it again, Attorney McLean. Thank you, Chair. Um, what this means to the city is the city at uh, the point that the uh, facility is built either by March 30th or March 31st of 2015 or within 90 days after the facility is constructed, the city would out, go out and borrow two and a half million dollars in order to pay for the construction of the facility uh, at the county. Uh, what that means to the taxpayer is currently taxpayers uh, are paying on the order of 1.2 million dollars in total levy between city and county combined uh, separate dispatch. Uh, when this takes effect, uh, even though the city has to borrow two and a half million dollars over a 10 year period, it would effectively reduce the 1.2 million dollars to roughly $900,000 for the first 10 years. And then after uh, years 11 through 20, the savings to the city would be roughly $600,000 to its tax levy. What that means for individuals uh, that would have a home with an equalized value of $150,000, you currently pay roughly $75 for separate dispatch today. Once the dispatch is combined in the first 10 years, that $75 would drop to $57 on an annual basis. And then in years 11 through 20, it would drop to roughly $38. So it's almost a 50% savings. And from a county perspective, the county currently pays $17 uh, on that same $150,000 equalized value home and would pay after that $37, which is almost double. So the city's rate gets almost cut in half, the county's rate almost doubles, but it spreads the combined cost of dispatch to all taxpayers in the county equally. And 
And uh, did you, do you have a copy of that, of B there, uh, just uh, the annual ongoing operational and maintenance costs, you know, how many personnel we're going to have? And basically, I, I think we all have a copy of this, but maybe for the benefit of the people at home, uh, the dispatch salaries are sure. good to uh, be? Yeah, the total uh, estimated operational costs for the first year is $2,150,000. It's broken up into 24 dispatchers for $1,650,000. Uh, a manager for that center of about 99,000 with benefits, four supervisors in that center that would cover 24 seven on shifts about 312,000 and maintenance costs of roughly 90,000. Uh, we believe that there's probably gonna be some synergies there and we believe the ongoing estimated cost would hopefully be less than that once the facility is up and operational probably after the first 12 to 15 months. Chairman. Just a quick, thank you. Um, just a quick comment on the on, annual ongoing and operation. I think it's important to note that um, once this thing goes through, and Attorney McLean, please correct me, we don't have a whole lot of input and say over that. This is just an initial estimate of what the ongoing operational costs are. Um, the county is going to be fully um, in charge of that facility, and they'll dictate the manning um, and the operation um, operational level of that facility. So. Um, again, I don't want people to take that because it could be, depending on how the county decides to run it, it could be higher, it could be lower. Right. This is just an original estimate of what that's going to look like. Yeah, that, that uh, sentence right after the, the, the $2.1 million, must, must, I think is what you're talking about, Alderman Hammond, it says, upon, fully, upon becoming fully operational, all ongoing costs will be borne by the county. County shall be fully responsible for the ongoing costs, regardless of whether the costs end up being more or less than estimated. In fact, this is something we have, we discussed at length in the conversations that we've had. Any questions for uh, Mr. Remodio? Alderman Lewandowski. I have one quick one about uh, Part A, where it says initial cost that it's estimated to cost two million five hundred thousand dollars, and that the city will pay that. What happens if the cost is over that amount? That's all the city pays is two and a half million dollars, whether it's under or over. We have cost estimates initially that we reviewed as a, as a group and uh, the cost <coughs> estimates were around two and a half million dollars. So that's what we agreed to. Thank you, Alderman Lewandowski. Any other questions for Mr. Amodio? Thank you, Jim. Uh, Steve, if you want to carry on with the rest of the uh, agreement, please. Sure. Uh, before I do that, just one observation on the, the city's capital contribution of the $2,500,000. Uh, uh, Mr. Modio referred to uh, borrowing that over 10 years, and there had been some previous discussions, and I, I think the uh, Shared Service Committee was talking about and had charts kind of looking at that, what the relative cost is over 10-year period and so forth. but. The last sentence there uh, does not restrict the city to a 10-year borrowing. It, the city shall obtain its contribution by whatever manner it deems appropriate. So say in 2015, uh, if that's when we need to do the borrowing uh, and it's more effective uh, or, or advantageous to the city to do the financing some other way, we have the ability to do that. We're not locked into necessarily borrowing the money over 10 years. Uh, uh, or what have you. Uh, uh, there's one reference to uh, revenue transfer at the bottom of page two at 7E, to the extent that the city is receiving hardline 911 or other funding exclusively as a consequence of operating an emergency communications dispatch system, city shall cooperate in transferring such funding to the county as county assumes the emergency communications dispatch functions from the city. Uh, I'm not positive whether or not the city gets any funds currently, but if you look, if you know on your, your monthly phone bill, there, there are charges on there for, uh, I don't know how they call them, but emergency services or something like that. that uh, some of those funds go back to uh, communities. I know at least, uh, I know for sure the county receives those dollars. Uh, for the operation of 911 systems. To the extent that the city is currently receiving any of those dollars as, as we phase out and are no longer providing uh, 
the 911 dispatch response system, uh, any of those funds would, would go to the county as opposed to staying with the city. <clears throat> um, with respect to the backup dispatch center that was referenced previously, item 7H <clears throat> indicates that to the extent that there are heating, electrical, or similar costs associated with housing the backup system, such costs are borne by the city. All other costs of equipping, maintaining, manning, and operating the backup dispatch center will be borne by the county. <clears throat> uh, seven, or excuse me, section eight on administration talks about uh, the combined dispatch communication center advisory committee that Alderman Hammond previously uh, referenced. Uh, Part of, part of the job, excuse me, Attorney McLean, but part of that administration, I would imagine, is that after this is up and running, if there are, if there are problems, if there are problems in the operation, that would be the sounding board for any, any issues that would come up in the uh, right. early operation of the system? It, I think that's the idea that uh, uh, if there are issues with the, uh, the transition and so forth, that would be addressed by that advisory committee. Alderman Hammond. Thank you. And not just issues, but again, setting protocol, you know, putting together a, a streamlined set of operating procedures. Um, the liaison committee for this will be the county's law committee, um, as is indicated in there. Um, they'll be the ones charged. So the advisory committee, again, is really charged with, you know, dealing with, because these are the, the, the people in the know. These, they're charged with, you know, building the protocols, bringing the team together, training, you know, all those types of things. Uh, the remaining provisions I would classify as boilerplate type of uh, okay. language in the agreement. Any questions for Attorney McQueen? Alderman Bellinger. Thank you, Chairman Bourne. Uh, is this going to be on the agenda Monday? I presume it will on. be. Yeah, I would imagine Mary would get that to suit him around. It would be up for a vote on Monday. Okay. I will then save my thank yous and comments for Monday. Okay. Alderman Hammond. Thank you, Mr. Uh, Chair. I would uh, make a motion to approve. Second. We have a motion and a second to approve document 4-4. Uh, uh, any discussion? Uh, would you call the roll on this one, Mary? Bellinger. Aye. Orange. Aye. Carlson. Aye. Becker. Aye. Donahue. Abstain. Hammond. Aye. Clough. Aye. Lassard. Aye. Lewandowski. Aye. Basler. Abstain. Van Akron. Abstain. Longman. Aye. Uh, motion carries. Uh, next meeting date, as I talked about before, we'll have a meeting uh, probably the second week of February. I'll be in consultation with Alder Person Donahue on that. I'll entertain a motion to adjourn. So moved. Second. We have a motion and a second to adjourn. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Chair votes aye. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.